So I want to welcome everyone. Thank you for joining Darien Library this Tuesday morning to learn more about fall garden preparation. I'd like to mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by annual Friends of the Library campaign. So we thank you for your support to make programs like this, as well as our collections, available to the community. So we have Sean here today. He's the general manager of the Gardeners Center and Florist. And he's going to give us his knowledge so we're prepared. Welcome, Sean. Thank you, guys. Thank you much. Um, it's nice to be here. Um, it's a perfect morning to um, sit around in front of the computer with a cup of coffee for an hour and not feel too guilty about it. Um, I'm going to talk about a fairly broad range of topics um, that have to do with gardening in the fall specifically. Um, I'm going to talk about things you should be doing in the fall in your vegetable garden, um, things you should be doing in the fall in your perennial garden. I'm also going to talk about a couple of specific plants that really benefit from a, a hard pruning in the fall. A lot of people are really afraid of pruning. I think it's one of the things that most people are most most apprehensive about doing in the garden. So I have two plants that most people have that I'm going to talk about that really benefit from a fairly aggressive pruning in the fall. And I'm also going to talk about something um, at the end that people ask a lot about at this time of year. Um, as we get into the colder months, a lot of people ask about what kind of pots they can leave outside over the winter. Like, can I leave my can I leave my ceramic pots out over the winter? Can I leave my cement pots out over the winter? And is there anything I can put in my pots that will actually survive the winter and look good all winter? So I'm going to cover that at the end. And then, um, uh, guys, obviously, as I go along, if you have any questions about what I'm currently talking about, feel free to ask. Um, and then at the end, if there's time, we can just take um, general gardening questions and try to answer as many of those as we can. Um, what I am going to start with, though, and I didn't, you know, I thought about this on the way in this morning. It's something that's really important every year in the fall for gardeners, but particularly so this year is a lot of people don't realize how important watering is going into the, through the fall and the winter. A lot of gardeners, even like experienced gardeners, once we start putting coats and sweaters on and it doesn't feel like summer anymore, we, um, we stop watering our plants. And I've actually seen um, irrigation companies out already blowing out lines and shutting people's irrigation off for the season and those companies do that because they can't do everybody's irrigation in one week. So they try to spread it out over a couple of couple of weeks or months in the fall. But if you guys have irrigation at home, try to keep that on until you know the first or second week in November. We, we're still two weeks away from our first frost date. So you don't have to worry about your, your irrigation freezing until we get into um until we get deeper into November. So if you can keep yours on, keep it going. Um there's two groups of plants that are especially critical to they need to be watered right through the fall. And you know, our the soil in Connecticut here in the shore usually doesn't freeze until closer to Christmas. So when I'm talking about watering through the fall, I'm talking about you know going all the way through Christmas if the ground isn't frozen. Um, two groups of plants that are critical that they be watered. Um, that would be anything that you planted this year. So anything that went in the, in the ground in the spring, summer, or fall of this year, whether it be a shrub or a perennial or even a lawn, if you've done lawn seeding, you want to keep that stuff um, watered right through December. Um, obviously, we're, we're experiencing drought conditions this year. We have um, a, a rainfall deficit. And you know those new plantings really need to be watered well until they're established, which usually takes a year. Um, the other group of plants that's super important to water are evergreens, um, particularly broadleaf evergreens. And when I say broadleaf evergreens, I'm talking about things like rhododendrons, azaleas, boxwoods, hollies, mountain laurels, that sort of thing. Um, deciduous plants that lose their leaves in the fall have an advantage over evergreen plants going into the winter because they lose their leaves. And leaves are how plants transpire. They lose moisture through um, pores underneath their leaves, kind of like we um, sweat through the pores on our body. That's why a lot of times in the winter, if it's really cold, if you have rhododendrons at home, and you know, even if it's a big old established rhododendron, when we have temperatures that go down below 20, you might notice that all their leaves are rolled up really tight like cigars on those really cold mornings. And that's the plant trying to prevent uh, moisture loss through those um, through the pores on the undersides of the leaves. So they roll up really tight like cigars to kind of, kind of uh, abate the um, moisture loss a little bit. So 
keep, even if you have established evergreen plants, you want to keep on watering them because we've been in a drought situation, you know, for months now. That pattern doesn't look like it's going to be changing anytime soon. Of course, Mother Nature, you know, it's all about averages, you know, so we have an average rainfall every year. So we're way low in rainfall right now, but we may make it up with snow over the winter. Let's, let's see what happens. But I did, you know, I wanted to start with the watering because it's just, it's really critical. You know, it's actually, for those evergreen plants, it's actually worse for them to sub be subjected to sub freezing temperatures when they're dry than to be subjected to hot temperatures when they're dry. So you really want to, um, you really want to make sure you're watering, you know, right through Christmas time if you can. And, um, you know, we're talking about an, about an inch of water a week. Um, whether you're, if you're using your irrigation or, you know, a good soaking, if you're hand watering, you're talking about a good, you know, soaking twice a week, right through December. So I just wanted to get, throw the watering thing out there first. And now I'm going to, is anybody, does anybody have, um, is anybody a vegetable gardening gardener? All right, good. Um, lots of new vegetable gardeners this year, for sure. Our, um, our vegetable sales were through the roof, vegetables disappeared by the end of the May, I couldn't even buy herbs or vegetables anymore from any of the growers, they were all gone. Um, lots of new veggie gardens this year. So some things you should be doing, whether you're, um, whether you're gardening in a raised bed or a plot or just a regular traditional garden plot in the fall, it's really important that you remove all of the plants. Um, if you're growing lettuce or kale, if you're growing fall crops, obviously they stay. Um, if you were growing tomatoes and cucumbers and squash, all those summer plants, once they, once we've had a couple of frosts, they'll be dead dead, but right now they probably aren't looking too great anyways. If you haven't removed them all already, you should. Um, many, as you've, if you've grown vegetables, you already know they're very prone to insects and they're very prone to diseases. And a lot of those insects and, in, um, fungal pathogens actually will overwinter in the soil in plant debris in your vegetable garden. And they'll just wait there until next spring when you plant new vegetables and then it rains and the water splashes the spores back up onto your, onto your plants and the cycle begins again. So if you all that plant debris should be removed, including the roots. When I was a kid, my dad always had a big vegetable garden and he always, um, he always went in with pruners and just cut everything down to the ground, the tomatoes, the peppers, everything. And he left the roots behind with the assumption that the roots would die and decompose over the winter and add um, organic matter to the soil, which technically it does, but there are actually a lot of um, nematodes and grubs that like that affect your plants in a not so good way that stay in the roots. So, Roots and all, pull everybody out, and never add vegetable plant debris to your compost pile unless it is like clean foliage. Like if you had cucumbers that had anthracnose, if you had tomatoes that had later early blight, that stuff should always go out with the household trash. You would never want to compost that. Clean foliage, clean healthy foliage, you can compost, but anything that was diseased should really be um, thrown out with your household trash. Um, most compost piles at home don't get hot enough to destroy um, insects or fungal pathogens. So you really just you skip the compost pile for your vegetable, vegetable break. Um, same thing, a lot of people will throw um, unripened tomatoes or rotten tomatoes into their compost pile, which is fine. Just keep in mind that, again, the compost isn't going to get hot enough to destroy any of, the, any of the seeds that may be in there. So you may end up with a lot of little volunteer tomato plants in your garden next year if, you, if you're composting um, your tomato fruits. Um, so after that, you know, after you remove everything from the garden, you also um, you want to add an inch or two of compost. A lot of people wait until the springtime to do this in you know, springtime, but a lot, of a lot of compost takes time to break down. So I always like to add an inch or two of compost in the fall and then repeat that in the, um, in the springtime, actually. In the fall, and nobody thinks of this, but the fall is actually a great time to set, if you need to do soil testing, Fall is a fantastic time to do that, especially if you're going to do a good test, if you're going to send your soil out to Yukon or to UMass Amherst. Um, a lot of times in the springtime, because everyone else is sending soil samples out, 
you may wait two or three weeks to get your results back. And um, then the remedies that you're going to use, if, whether you're trying to change your pH or you're trying to change um, different mineral values, the remedies take time to, to work as well. So the fall is a great time, you know, before the soil freezes, you know, the next six weeks or so, the fall is a great time to send samples out to, to those labs and get a comprehensive test done. And then you can, um, then if you need to make any changes, like your pH is off, you know, ideally a vegetable garden's pH should be about 6.5. So if you need to lower your pH or raise your pH, the um, lime takes a while to work. So a lot of people typically throw it down in the springtime when they're at the same time they're planting. But it takes, you know, it takes a few weeks to start working. So that's, um, some, that's something you should definitely consider doing in the fall. And you won't have to wait two or three weeks to get your test results back either. Um, so that's a great thing. Um, also, you know, the fall would be the time to add compost and, um, for organic matter and lime to adjust your pH. Adding nutrients, you know, like if you need to add nitrogen or phosphorus or anything like that, that you wait till springtime to do because that that will break down and be gone by the time your plants need it. So that you that you wait till springtime to do. Um, at, so add your compost, a couple inches of compost, turn that into the soil, and then I really like to add a mulch. And when I say mulch, we don't want to use bark mulch or anything, or shredded wood products like you would use in your ornamental beds. Um, wood mulches tend to create an acidic reaction in the soil, which vegetables don't like. Um, a great thing to use for the um, mulch, for your mulch for your vegetable gardens is um, like the shredded hay products that they sell for um, like when you do when you reseed your lawn, the, the sterilized hay that doesn't contain any seeds. Um, Put your compost in, turn the soil, and then add two or three inches of the hay over the winter. It's gonna, it's gonna number one. It's super important for um, for um, earthworm activity. Um, earthworms don't like to be in soil where the soil is directly exposed to the elements. And we don't, um, we don't have reliable snow cover here anymore. I can't remember the last winter where we got snow in December and it was there until March. I mean, last year. I think we had one storm with four inches and then it melted a week later and it was just it's it's and it's you know it's bitter cold without snow is not good is not good for um a lot of plants but it also discourages earthworm activity which you want in your um in your vegetable garden for sure and the nice thing about the the straw is after it sits there all winter you can turn that into the soil in the springtime and that's a great source of um great source of nitrogen and it adds a lot of organic matter and body to your soil. So definitely, um, definitely consider that. And then the other thing to think about, if you're thinking of expanding your vegetable garden, the fall's a great time to do that too. Um, everybody's, you know, you know, got a lot of, there's a lot of things to do in the yard in the springtime when the temperatures are warming up and you got to start mowing the lawn and all that, but the, garden, the fall is a great time to um, expand your vegetable garden for sure. Um, so that's vegetable gardens. So now I'm going to talk about perennials, um, specifically if any of you guys are doing native plants or pollinator gardens, you know, that sort of thing. We're going to talk about some perennial um, perennial garden maintenance for the fall. Um, typically, your perennials would be cut back <clears throat> after we get a couple of hard freezes. Now we haven't even had our first frost yet. Our first frost here on the shore in southwest Connecticut, it's usually around October, Halloween. You know, it's usually a few days before or a few days after. Um, with your perennials, you really want to wait until after we've had a couple of um, hard freezes. Um, I'm talking, you know, mid-November. I can remember, you know, being a kid, my great-grandmother was a big perennial gardener. And we always went out. It was always very close to Thanksgiving. And we cut down all the perennials. And then I... She got me rake lawn leaves onto the beds for the winter. And then of course in the spring, I got to rake them off again. <laughs> but that was the that was the routine there. You don't want to um you don't want to cut back your perennials too early. Um a lot of your perennials, if anybody has hostas, uh, most people have a hosta in their yard. Um, you'll notice a lot of perennials go from green to yellow, or they'll actually change colors the same way that the leaves on deciduous trees do. And the perennials are kind of doing the same thing the trees are. They're drawing energy out of the foliage and bringing them it down into their roots for the um, for the winter. So a lot of times plants start to look a little unsightly at this time of year, and we're kind of in a hurry to cut them back. 
um, but we don't want to we don't want to do that too soon. Um, you want to let the, the plants cycle down, and you'll know when to cut them back. They'll either be completely brown or completely yellow after we've had a couple of hard freezes. <clears throat> this applies for most perennials. Now, we talked earlier about the importance of removing plant debris um, from the vegetable garden to get rid of um, bad bugs and bad diseases so that they're not there over the winter. If you guys are working with native plants at all or pollinator friendly perennials, you know, specifically, um, I would ask you to not cut them back. Um, a lot of, for the opposite reason we were talking about getting rid of your vegetable debris, a lot of our pollinators and a lot of our beneficial insects overwinter in the perennial debris till next year. So a lot of, um, a lot of hoverflies and um, beetles that are pollinator beetles, not foliage eating beetles. A lot of those guys will lay their eggs or hibernate in the stems of your perennial plants because they have a, a food source and they want to make sure that either when they wake up in the spring or when their kids come around next year, that they're in a place where there's a food source ready for them. So if you can live with some unsightliness from your perennials over the winter, um, do try to leave your native plants upright and you know a lot of them cone flowers black-eyed susans liatris a lot of those guys don't look terrible in the winter and they're also a good food source for birds in the winter time so there's a lot of if you can leave perennials behind you know that are especially pollinator perennials or native plants i would leave those behind if you could um they are um they are like i said they're a refuge and a, and a little habitat for a lot of these beneficial insects over the winter and then you leave them behind until the spring, but you also want to not cut them back and throw them away too early. I know sometimes we'll get some nice weather in the very end of February, beginning of March. And if you cut them back too soon, then you're going to be sending the, you know, you're going to be sending the beneficial insects off to the, off to the landfill. So we want to make sure we, you know, keep your, your plants that you didn't cut back until like mid to late March so that they have a chance for their, for their, for their cycle to continue along. Let's see. And then you're also going to, um, I sold a bunch of um, lobster compost to a customer yesterday for her perennial beds. I, I've never been a fan of wood mulch on perennial beds. Um, number one, like with the vegetables, it tends to create an acidic reaction in the soil. It, um, most perennials, with the exception of like the shady perennials, the costas and the stilbes and ferns, they like an acidic situation because they normally would grow in the woods. Um, your typical sun, your sunny perennials, when you're talking about coneflowers and phlox and irises and peonies, things like that that grow out in the out in the open, they typically would want a more neutral soil. So I don't like to use a wood mulch on them. A lot of times it's nice just to plant perennials close enough that you don't need a mulch because the perennials are filling in the whole area. Um, but what I do like to do with the perennials is, like we talked about, um, adding an inch or two of compost to the vegetable garden in the fall. Um, I like to add an inch or two of compost to the perennial beds in the fall and, and not turn it in, but use it as an actual mulch. Um, and then in the springtime, you can lightly, light, lightly rake that in. Um, so there's a lot of different um, compost that you can use as, um, as a mulch, as opposed to using bark chips or, or cedar, or that, that sort of thing. Um, a shop. Yeah. Would you put that mulch around hydrangeas? You would definitely put a mulch around hydrangeas. I mean, wood mulch can definitely go around hydrangeas or, oh, okay. or the compost. Yeah. Either yeah. one? Either one yeah. is good for hydrangeas. So I'm actually, at the beginning when I said I was going to talk specifically about two kinds of plants that a lot of people have, hydrangeas is going to be one of them. Oh, all right. So I am yeah. going to be, I'm going to be talking about them in a few. Um, specifically pruning, but we'll get into a little bit of their winter care also, because the hydrangeas are also one of those plants that don't appreciate the um, the snowless winters that we have here. So it's also, you know, a lot of people ask all the time about moving and dividing perennials, and um, the fall is a good time to do that um, for for most for most plants. Um, typically. Typically, you know, up until the beginning of November. So we're getting we're getting that window's closing. 
But if you need to move peonies, if you need to move hostas, you need to move irises, now is a much better time to do that than in the springtime. When you dig up a plant in the springtime and divide it and move it, you're doing that just as the plant's getting ready to grow. And obviously, no matter how careful you are when you dig a plant out of the ground, you're going to sever some roots and you're going to cause some disruption. So you're 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 putting a plant in a situation where it's it maybe it lost some roots, maybe it's been disrupted a bit, and now it's going into the growing season where it's going to be using all this energy to grow foliage and stems, and the days are going to be getting warmer and warmer, and its water needs are going to increase as the temperature gets warmer. The nice thing about the fall is the plants are done growing, but the, the top of the plant is done growing, but the roots of the plant are gonna continue growing vigorously until the soil freezes, you know, mid-December or so. So this is a fantastic time, not just perennials, but it's also a fantastic time to move shrubs without having to worry about shocking the plant, but they'll also, their roots will get nicely established because they have a good six to eight weeks for their roots to reestablish before, you know, the soil freezes and they stop growing altogether for the winter. Um, you know, the soil temperature right now is, is, war is as warm as it's going to be. Um, in the springtime, it takes a long time for the soil to warm up. So it's ideal time to transplant and divide um, shrubs and perennials right now. And it's also um, a great time. We're going to get to those hydrangeas now. It's also um, so hydrangeas and also roses um, are two plants that benefit from a pruning in the fall. And like I said earlier, I think, I think pruning is the thing that most gardeners are the most apprehensive about doing. And a lot of people just don't do it because they're worried that they're going to cause some damage or cause some harm. So roses and, you know, over the past, you know, 10, 15 years, the shrub roses have become very popular. It used to be hybrid tea roses and grand forest. Um, right now, it's, you know, the past 10, 15 years, it's been shrub roses like knockout roses and David Austin shrub roses. And those guys really benefit in the fall from a, from a hard prune. And I, when I say a hard prune, I'm saying prune them back halfway to two thirds. Um, a lot of times roses will get really scraggly over the winter or over during the course of the growing season. Um, they only flower on new growth. So you really want, the more you cut back, the more new growth you're gonna encourage in the springtime. Um, what you wanna be careful with, again, if you're gonna do any of these rejuvenational prunings or hard prunings, you wanna wait until later in the fall. And I usually, I love to use holidays to remember things as they pertain to gardening. So I usually like to do rose pruning in hydrangea pruning. I like to use Thanksgiving as a pruning time for that. And again, you want to wait until you've had a few freezes. If you do it too early, like even now, because we haven't had a frost yet, if you go and start cutting back roses heavily right now, it's still warm enough that they're going to potentially push out new growth again, as if you prune them back in the summertime. And then what's going to happen is that new growth is not going to have a, a have enough time to harden off or mature before we get our first freeze and then all that new growth is just gonna is just gonna fry so if you're going to do heavy pruning in the fall we want to make sure it's after a couple of hard freezes and you know in this area um the week before thanksgiving the week after thanksgiving is is ideal timing for that um so that's for any any rose bush um that you can that you, you could possibly have is going to benefit from a hard prune in the fall every year and sometimes they get overgrown anyways and they outgrow their space. So you can definitely prune them back. Maybe one year you cut them back halfway and then the next year you cut them back by a third. But I highly recommend hitting them every year. And the other plant, now when I, we talk about hydrangeas, I mean, we could do a whole Zoom session on hydrangeas alone because there's a, it's a very big topic. There's a bunch of different ones. They all require different kinds of care, different kinds of pruning. But the hydrangeas that I'm talking about pruning in the fall, I actually printed out a picture here so we all know the snow who we're talking about here, is um, is the um, PG hydrangeas. I've, everybody knows these guys have gotten super popular over the past few years. They're the ones that flower later in the summer, July, and they usually start white. And then they get that pink blush to them and then they get a reddish color later on. There's lime white, little lime, vanilla shake. There's lots of different ones. And those guys have a tendency to 
get overgrown. And they respond really, really well to an annual pruning. And it was a tradition of, before my mom retired and moved away, I had an annual tradition of pruning her PG hydrangeas on Thanksgiving morning while we were waiting for the food to cook. That was just something I did when I showed up every year. Um, same as the roses, um, cut them back by at least a third, a halfway is better. Those hydrangeas, if you don't prune them back, they tend to just resume their growth the following year and the stems can get very big and floppy. The flowers are already heavy and they can become really floppy and really messy. So by pruning them back every year, you're, you're causing the stems to get stronger and thicker. And again, they flower only on new growth. So you're only going to get more flowers. The more you prune them back, the more new growth they're going to have to throw out the following spring and the more flowers you're going to get. Um, same rule applies. Don't prune them back too early because they'll, um, they'll start growing again and that growth won't harden off before the winter, before we get our freeze. Um, if you want to cut stems here and there to bring them in and for a vase or to dry them, absolutely. They're, they're great inside. Um, but do wait until, again, that Thanksgiving time is when I like to do my pruning on those. And Jane, as you were asking earlier, yes, you would definitely, that type of hydrangea and the mop head hydrangeas, which I think you were talking about, definitely benefit from a mulch as well in the winter. Um, the, mop head, the mop head hydrangea pruning is different, and I'm not even going to get into that right now because that's a whole, that's a whole, whole other can of worms. Um, that would probably take a half an hour alone just to talk about mop head pruning. Um, if you have any specific questions about it at the end, though, I will certainly answer them. Um, another thing that's happening right now is people are bringing plants in from outdoors. Um, people bring house plants outside and they want to bring them in for the winter. Um, it's time to do that right now. Our first frost is a couple weeks away. Another thing people ask me about a lot this time of year is not necessarily bringing house plants in, but a lot of people will buy let's call them higher end annuals, you know, things like um, tropical hibiscus, um, citrus, like an orange or a lemon tree, a gardenia, things like that. You know, a lot of people ask about bringing them inside the house for the winter. You can, um, and what I always tell people is you just, you have to lower your expectations. Um, <laughs> And citrus, and citrus trees, I think, are the most frustrating of all of them is because everybody loves the idea of having a lemon tree on their patio during the summer, but then you have to bring it inside for the winter. And these aren't house plants. Um, these guys, you know, think about an orange grove. If you've ever seen an orange grove in Florida, they're out in the full sun all day and, you know, high humidity. And that's what they get to enjoy while they're out on their patio in the summertime. And those conditions are pretty much impossible to replicate inside a house. Um, you're not going to be able to have, a, unless you have a, a greenhouse, you're not going to be able to provide eight hours of direct sun on, on a hibiscus or a citrus tree. The humidity disappears from here in the wintertime. And of course, if you're running hot air heat in the house, the, then it's like desert dry inside in the wintertime. So the trick with all those, and this, you know, it goes for bougainvillas, it goes for mandevillas, you know, a lot of people bring those in in the winter because, you know, they can be expensive and sometimes you're just not ready to say goodbye at the end of the year um, and you want to give them a shot. You can bring them in, but what you really want to do is bring it in and keep it alive so that, you know, back outside again in, in the springtime. Um, you don't want to bring them in and expect them to thrive inside the house. And you actually kind of want to discourage it. Um, you don't want to fertilize or water too much. They can be kept in a cooler situation. Um, they don't need to be, you know, encouraged to grow because they're not going to be, if they, even if they do grow inside the house, their growth is going to be very leggy and stretchy because um, the, the direct light isn't there. Um, so you want to kind of want them I, ideally you kind of want to bring, if you bring a hibiscus plant inside, you kind of want it to sit and stay just the way it looked when you brought it in for the winter and then put it back outside in the summertime. Um, so just, and again, they can be kept cooler. Um, you can cut that way back on the watering. You know, a lot of those flowering plants do benefit from a period of dormancy, which you can kind of replicate by cutting back on the water and not fertilizing them. But, you know, the, the key to success is not to expect a lot from them in the house. 
you're not going to be able to put a 10 inch hibiscus in a, in your living room and have it behave like a parlor palm. It's just, they're not meant to be indoors. So trick is lower your expectations and just, you know, keep them alive over the winter and not, don't expect them to thrive inside of the, don't expect them to thrive inside of the house. Um, that, that was, um, that's really the, the key to success there. Um, the other thing I was going to talk about on that same subject, and it's a question that starts coming up a lot this time of year, is, um, excuse me, is um, you can buy, almost everybody has pots on their porch or pots around a pool or pots somewhere in the yard. And people ask all the time, can I leave this pot outside over the winter? Um, and the question, the answer to that question can be yes, it can be maybe, or it can be definitely no. Um, and it all really depends on what the material of the pot is made of. Um, big problem here, you know, the, the issue with pottery outside in the winter here isn't that it gets cold. As a matter of fact, if we all lived in Minneapolis, we would probably be able to leave all our pottery outside year round and not have to worry about it. Um, the problem here is it doesn't stay cold. We get sub-zero weather followed by we always have that january thaw where we have three or four days where it's in the upper 40s and rains and what ends up happening if you have pots outside that are terracotta or um cement the soil inside the pot will get wet and then it'll freeze which is fine but then it'll thaw out and halfway and then we'll get two days of rain and it'll get soaked and then it'll go from 48 degrees to 15 degrees in seven hours like it often does here during the winter time and the you know the the soil expands quickly and it cracks your pots right in half um some things you can do to prevent that um it's really critical if you do leave pots outside with soil in them over the winter um, a lot of times if you're on a covered porch you have it, it won't have any trouble at all um, if they're out in the open, the key to success is drainage. Um, it's, the, it's the key to success. Um, if you have pots that sit directly on a smooth surface, a flat surface or soil, you want to get the bo bottom of that pot up off the ground. You can use little pot feet. You can use little strips of, of wood. You just want to elevate them up off the ground so that they're not making contact with, with the flat surface. Because what ends up happening is either soil or water gets into the drainage holes and forms little corks. And then when we get that January thaw or that February thaw and we get some rain and it doesn't have any way to get out of the pot. And that, you know, that compounds, that compounds the problem. Um, terracotta pots should never be left outside over the winter. I mean, they're, they're porous. So they, they actually absorb water. So if you leave a terracotta pot outside and it gets wet, and then it freezes, it's just gonna crumble. Um, same thing even with like cast stone statuary or garden art pieces. If you leave that on the, on a soil surface over the winter, a lot of times during the freeze thaw, freeze thaw cycle, they'll just um, wick moisture out of the ground. And when it's above freezing and then it goes below freezing and it just cracks. So that's another, that's another item that you want to either bring inside or get onto a onto a surface like a, a flat cement surface or a wood surface for the winter time um a question that goes along with um which pots can i leave out well, right now everybody's got their mums and their cabbage and their kale and their pots but after we get through the fall season and holiday season once we get to christmas time you know a lot of people want to put plants in the pots for the winter and there aren't a lot of plants that work over the winter in, in pots here where we where we live in garden. Um, and obviously people usually want to use evergreen plants because you don't want to look at bare sticks in a pot over the winter. So things like boxwoods and hollies and little spruces are really popular to use over the winter. Um, here's a good general guideline. If you um if you want to use plants, evergreen plants in your containers over the winter and you don't care if they survive until spring because you're going to throw them out and plant pansies in March, you can use any of those plants. 
Um, a lot of people, because those plants tend to be more expensive than annuals, um, would like to get more use out of them, just using them as a seasonal annual for the winter. So if you want to plant box woods in your planters for the winter and then use them in the landscape in the spring, um, box woods have probably a 50-50 chance of surviving the winter in a container. Holly never survives the winter in a container. Holly's roots are only hardy to about 25 degrees. Um, so hollies never make it through the winter. Um, Alberta spruces, little spruce trees, anything with a, anything with a needled foliage to it. Um, everybody likes the way boxwoods and hollies look. They are a little bit prettier. But anything with a needled foliage is going to survive the winter in a pot, even if it goes 30 below zero. Um, you're not going to have any trouble with those. I've been doing this for almost 30 years. <clears throat> and every year there's plants that we don't sell that we um, have left over in the nursery that we have to keep for the winter time. I've killed one of everything in the almost 30 years I've been doing this, trust me. <laughs> um, Alberta spruces, no. Alberta spruces, I can literally leave in their little grower plastic pots out back without mulch or any kind of protection all winter, and they're good to go in the springtime. Um, with the broadleafed evergreens, the one benefit to them, if you do use them, because I say they don't make it over the winter, but what happens with them is like your boxwoods or your hollies, if you do use those for your winter pots, they will stay alive and fresh looking all winter. What usually happens with them is they look like they're perfect all winter. And then once we get into late March, early April, once it starts to warm up, they'll just turn orange and drop all their leaves in the course of the week. Because what ends up happening, I'm sure you guys have had plenty of times where you've maybe you've had a Christmas wreath on the front door and it still looked great in March. The same thing happens with these little evergreens. They die but because it's cold out they get kind of preserved in that green state so um so they still look presentable but nine times out of ten they're not going to make it over the winter so if you do want um if you do want evergreens in your pots over the winter time you and you want them to survive because you want to make use of them after you're done with them as a container plant you definitely want to look for plants with um, needles as opposed to um leaves it could be juniper, it could be cedar, it could be um, spruces, firs, any of those guys. But definitely um, hollies, boxwoods, andromedas, those guys typically do not survive the winter here. Well, that was all I had formally ready to talk to you guys about. I don't know if you have any questions about anything that I just talked about or anything in general, I think we have some time to answer some questions. So I'd, be lo I'd love to answer them for you if I could. Yes, so, so you're absolutely correct. So sweet pea is exactly the type of mulch you'd want to use on perennials in the fall. Um, sweet pea, I sell a product here at the store from Coast of Maine, which is a similar type of a product called Fundy Blend from Coast of Maine. It's um, made mostly from seaweed. So it's, in, and of course your sweet pea is made from stable, stable, stable sweepings from horse stables. So it's not a wood mulch per se, it's more of a straw mulch, you know, a decomposed or semi-rotted straw mulch. So you definitely want to stay away from the wood mulches with the perennials, yeah. unless it's in the shade. The shady perennials, I, the wood mulch is fine, but any of those, um, any, most of your summer perennials, your ornamental grasses, I mean, think about these, these, these are plants that in, in nature would be growing out in open meadows and fields. So they, they're not in a situation where they have tree bark or anything like that, you know, falling on them. You know, they'd be, they'd be getting mulched with, with plant debris. So you, using that kind of mulch on your perennials is, is the way to go, absolutely. Or like I said earlier, if you don't want to use a mulch, you can use a compost as a mulch over the winter. And then that's going to behave as a mulch over the winter, but it's also going to break down and add a lot of nutrients to the soil and, and your soil structure as it breaks down. Wow. Yep, so it's way too early to do it now when um, you're going to see them change color if they haven't started already. Um, they'll usually go from green to kind of a, to a kind of a yellowy reddish orange color. Um, but like we talked about earlier, um, you really want to wait until we've had a couple of hard freezes. 
Um, so mid-November, you should be able to cut those back without any trouble. And then also, you don't want to necessarily, dis you obviously wouldn't turn or till the soil because the asparagus plants remain in there over the winter, but they are really heavy feeders. And I would highly recommend getting some good compost on your asparagus bed in the fall and spring every year for sure. Okay. Absolutely. Also, the, the berries that are on, the red berries, are those actually the seeds and will they reseed themselves? That's, they are actually the seeds and um, the birds love them. But yes, any that are left there behind, once those berries ripen and they split open, they will seed themselves in your, in your um, asparagus bed, okay. absolutely. So wait until they brown before we cut them back. And you said that that's probably mid, mid to late November or so? Yep, yeah, again, right around Thanksgiving time, they should have um, fully ripened and opened by then. So that would be safe to take them and cut them back at that time. Okay. But yeah, I can't, asparagus is probably one of the heaviest feeding vegetable mm -hmm. plants there are. And the, the better your soil is and the more you put into that bed, the more you're gonna get out of it. It's, it's a well worth the investment. Of, okay. the, of the of the compost in your time for sure thank you. thank you you don't want to use the compost if it's not ready yet yeah you okay. don't even if i put down now and then i use the i plant the next spring still not okay yeah it won't it won't i mean if it's if it's almost done you could put it down on the garden now but if it's still like inside if you can still see that what the plant what the components of the compost were it's too early to use it and you'd be better to let it continue composting over the winter and put that down in the springtime i would oh, okay I, yeah i wouldn't use you uh, even if you wanted to buy some compost and put it down now and give your you know give your compost the other five or six months to, to finish as opposed to putting it down you know when it's unfinished because then you may just end up with a bunch of a bunch of stems and sticks and leaves in the garden that you'll have to rake out in the springtime. So you definitely want to let that finish before you use it. It's it's not a process you can you can speed up. Unfortunately, it's really an uh, issue. Of, uh, yeah, it's really an issue of of time and temperature. Um, you know, the compost, the center of the compost pile has to reach a certain temperature, and then um, there's got to be a certain amount of aeration that happens, which is turning on your part. Um, it's a complicated topic. There has to be a certain amount of green versus brown material, you know, mixed. And then a certain temperature has to be hit. You know, interest, uh, interesting uh, quick story. This past spring, obviously it was um, a banner year, not just for us as a garden center, but for all garden centers across the United States had one of the best years they've ever had um which i feel guilty a lot about because it was a very bad year for so many other businesses um but we were luckily able to stay open and people were home and had nothing else to do and it was really you know it's kind of nice you know everybody said you know let's let's start a garden and let's work in the yard with the kids and you know there was so much of that that happened this year um products that normally are plentiful year round just disappeared this year. I couldn't get, we went for three weeks in June this year without a bag of potting soil or a bag of compost in the store that I couldn't get from anyone because it was all gone. Like nationally, it was all gone. And the compost makers and the potting soil makers had plenty of bags, but they couldn't they couldn't make compost faster because it takes, you know, several years sometimes. And, you know, it took, I, it took months for all of those products to come back online again. So yeah, the compost is, it's tricky. Um, I would definitely implore you to do some research online with the compost. Um, it's not something that's, it's a lot of science involved with making compost and, and time. So mm -hmm. it's definitely, yeah, and there are a lot of research or resources online about it. And there's different kinds of composting. And then a lot of people, a lot of people that compost have very different opinions about the right way to do it. So it's really, it's really something you got to take some time and really sort through for sure. 
I saw somebody, I think, on the screen had a question about um, catmint. Did I see somebody asking a question about catnip? Catmint? Kim was asking whether or not she should cut back her catmint. I believe that was the question. Um, yes, but not all the way. Um, catmint is one of those plants, a lot of perennials, like a hosta, for instance, um, die back completely to the ground and you don't see any evidence of it over the winter. Um, Nepeta always has a bit of a rosette at the bottom. There's always a lot of growth really tight down to the tight down at the ground with Nepeta and it'll persist all winter. Um, so Nepeta is one of those plants. And I, I generally, I say this about all perennials because just to avoid confusion, um, cut them back to three or four inches above the ground. Um, even if it's a plant that does die back completely, in the winter time, like a cone flower, for instance, it's nice if you leave the three or four inches behind. You'll you have like a, a plant marker in the springtime. You know where it is, so you don't dig it up by mistake or something. You'll at least have you'll know where it was. So Nepeta cut back, and you know Nepeta will stay. Nepeta is semi evergreen, so it'll um it'll kind of have a presence over the winter time. So cut it back three to four inches above the ground. There might oh, be another one coming in. Yep. And there's the blue Thank hydrangea you. pruning question. <laughs> so, so here's how that works. Um, that subject has always been complicated. And it got even more complicated 20 years ago when Bailey Nursery introduced the endless summer hydrangea. Because the, the answer to the blue hydrangea question was always never prune it back. Is the blue hydrangeas or mop head hydrangeas, they flower on the previous season's growth. So if you were to cut your hydrangea back in the fall or in the winter or the early spring, you were going to remove all of your flowers and you would have a nice green leafy plant all summer, but no flowers. And then the following year, you'd get flowers on that growth. Um, that, so it was a fairly easy answer to that question was don't cut your blue hydrangeas back. Um, unless you need to trim them back a little bit and then you would do it right after they flower. Um, 20 years ago, Bailey Nursery out in Minnesota introduced the Endless Summer Hydrangea. Um, Endless Summer, it's genetics um, that they worked on so that the hydrangea would flower on both old and new growth. And there's probably, that was the original reblooming hydrangea. Um, there's hundreds of them now, hundreds too many of them now that rebloom. So now the, to answer the blue hydrangea pruning question is, is your plant more than 15 or 20 years old? Or is it something that came in that you planted in the last 10 or 15 years? If it's, if it's less than 20 years old, it's more than likely um, one of the reblooming hydrangeas, in which case you can cut them back as far as you like, um, because they're gonna flower on old and new growth. And a lot of them actually flower a lot more when you cut them back all the way because they have to force, it forces all this new growth and all new flowers. Um, if in doubt with hydrangeas and everybody, and landscapers are most, most guilty of this, um, those mop head hydrangeas, when we get our first hard freeze in the fall, you know, a lot of, a lot of trees and shrubs get beautiful fall foliage before they drop their leaves. And the hydrangea leaves just are green until we get our first freeze, and then they just all turn into black mush. And a lot of people, as soon as they see that, and especially landscapers, are very tempted to just go out and cut the stems all down to the ground. Um, best course of action with the hydrangeas, whether they are newer varieties that rebloom or the old fashioned ones that don't, I like to leave them as is going into the fall. Um, they almost inevitably die back a bit over the winter time, and in the springtime they start to leaf out fairly early. You usually see those little um, those little buds swelling along the stems. They look like little cabbages, and they usually start at the base and then work their way up the stems. And you'll usually see a point where you have green buds coming out, and then there's just bare brown sticks beyond there. And then you can go in and, and snip snip off those brown tips, but if you can leave your if you can leave your mop head or your blue hydrangeas alone, I recommend just not going near them with 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 pruners, unless you're controlling size. Yeah. Sorry. 
<laughs> so that guy, all those, all those yellow leaves can be clipped right off of the pair of scissors. You know, clip okay. those off as close as you can to the center of the plant. Now, do I wait till they're completely dry, or just go for it? Oh right? no, take them off. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, anything that's yellow is not going to turn green again. Um, okay. Clip them off so the plant can devote its energy towards the healthy growth mm -hmm. instead of devoting energy trying to repair what can't be reversed there. Okay. So yeah, I put a, my. Oh, sorry. That, yeah, that one's definitely overwatered. I'm curious, does the pot have drainage holes in the bottom or no? That's it does. Um, it does. Oops, as I just made a mess. Um, yeah. I will put it in a dish of water and let it soak in the water that way. So yeah. I know, you know, when it's done drinking, yep. How but well? um, I guess I need to let it sit out for a little bit longer before I put it in the pot. Yep. That, that particular type of plant likes to dry out completely between waterings. Okay. So if you're, if you're watering it in a situation where you're keeping it consistently kind of moist all the time, it's mm -hmm. going to get some root rot and the leaves are going to do what they're doing there. So you definitely want to okay. cut back on the water, especially going into the winter now that the days are shorter. Okay, good to know. Thank sure. you. My plant thanks you too. <laughs> yeah, of course. And then I think, can we have a couple more? Um, Sean, speaking about watering, uh, I was always taught, uh, you know, water from above, not below. But yeah. I have luck when I put a plant, especially a gardenia, mm -hmm. in a pan of water, or like mm -hmm. overnight, and let it soak from, from the bottom. Yep. I mean, that's the way I've kept gardenias alive for and blooming for maybe, you know, at least a year. Oh, yeah. Is that yeah. okay? Absolutely. I mean, As a matter of fact, um, whenever I water the plants here inside our greenhouse, mm -hmm. um, our, our house plants, I fill up a big big bucket with water and yeah. i take i take the plants individually and i actually plunge them submerge oh. them under water i let all the air bubbles trickle out i take them out i shake them off and put them back on the shelf so oh. there's absolutely no harm in doing that um you just want to make sure when you water that way you want to let them dry pretty thoroughly and then soak them thoroughly you don't want to you don't want to create a situation where you're just watering them once a week whether they need it or not you want to I, yeah. And I, I I do this with azaleas as well. Oh, okay. And it really works well. Oh yeah, from watering from below, absolutely. Yeah, there's no yeah, there's no problem at all with that. For sure. And then did, did I see somebody with a question about rhododendrons? About pruning of rhododendrons, someone asked. Yeah. Yep. So the rhododendrons are, that's an easy one to answer about pruning. <clears throat> so rhododendrons, typically if a shrub blooms in the spring, and when I say in the spring, I'm talking about before Memorial Day. If a shrub blooms before in the spring, spring blooming shrubs should always be pruned immediately after they flower. So think about it, you know, you have rhododendrons, azaleas, forsythias, lilacs, things that are blooming really early, like before their leaves even start to grow. And the reason that's happening is because they have already made and set their flower buds the year before. So if you prune your, if you prune your rhododendrons in the fall, and remember I love holidays for remembering gardening things, you would never prune a rhododendron or an azalea after the 4th of July. Um, you can prune them. They're usually done flowering in the end of May, beginning of June. You can prune them all you want up until the 4th of July or the middle of July. But then after that, they're going to need time to grow and to set buds for the following year. So you would never, you would never prune a uh, rhododendron or azalea or any of the spring blooming shrubs, spireas, you know, andromedas, mountain laurels. You wouldn't prune any of those. Um, you wouldn't prune any of those in the fall or the winter or the spring always immediately when they're done flowering. As soon as the flowers start dropping off, I think is a great time to go and prune those guys. Um, what about this stuff that you get from the dump? Is it like um, compost or wood chips? You know, my yard man comes and throws it around. Would you say no? <laughs> no. That's, <what> I... <laughs> that's a 
that's a you get what you pay for kind of a situation and i believe it's free yeah it is, <laughs> yes. it is. <laughs> yeah um they're trying you know obviously to do a service um the problem with that compost is it's as we were talking about earlier with the other gal who asked about the compost it's not done mm. and a lot of times if you put compost that's still composting on a bed of soil it will actually suck nitrogen out of the soil and into itself as a as a as a and it's the same thing it's the same thing a lot of times the tree guys will um will come and chop up cut down a tree in your yard and run it through the shredder and then it's like well here's free mulch for your yard but the same thing that raw bark is it will rob the nutrients out of your soil so um you know there are certainly places to use the compost that they have here at the town available for free but i would certainly not use it if you had like an award-winning rose bed or something like that or i would definitely not go near there with that for sure okay yeah you, you can um it's scary i understand yeah, it, yeah it's scary um you're, you'd want your timing to be right. You'd want to do it, you know, just as the flowers are starting, the petals are starting to drop and fall. You can, um, you can cut it back severely. You might see, you might be cutting the leaves off and you where you have a bunch of bare sticks. Um, yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. As long as your timing is all right, it would be fine. I've cut mature rhododendrons down to a stump with a chainsaw before. And they've regenerated from the tr from the stump in the ground. Um, oh. so, so you can definitely you can definitely do it. You just want to make sure their timing is right. You want to do it right there at the end of the May, beginning of June, right as they're getting ready to send out all that new growth. And it might take it a year or two to be shapely again, but you can you can definitely do that without a problem. And they, they often need that because they get very open and bare underneath and, and leggy mm -hmm. over time. They also, um, they don't live forever either. A lot of people come in all the time with azaleas that are 40 or 50 years old and they're trying to make them look nice again. You know, a lot, you know, some plants, trees, etc., will live for hundreds of years. But a lot of those, a lot of those ornamental shrubs, you know, 40, 50 years sometimes is their, you know, useful, you know, lifespan, you know, as far as as far as looking good, but you can definitely, um, you can cut that back. You don't have to be scared of that as long as your timing is right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. I think we all have lots of questions. But <laughs> yeah. Far, you know, this has been fabulous, Sean. Thank you for your help in doing this for Darien Library and our patrons. I'm sure we all want to say, how much we appreciate it. Absolutely. And I mean, if you guys, uh, you guys have any other questions, you know, I'm here five days a week. Great. So anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Amanda. you very much. Thank you guys. It was a pleasure. Have a great day, everyone. Bye now. Thank you. Bye.